Thank you all. Um, it's great to be here um, for the first, uh, like my first ever, or like kickoff orientation event. This is Tony, um, and so I'm really excited to join you all today. Um, you know, I'm particularly excited to be in conversation with three amazing people. Um, first, I'll be in conversation directly with Eddie Cole, who is, I will say, before I talk about his title and everything, Eddie was actually my mentor through um, the Spencer um, Dissertation Fellowship, the National Academy of Education, um, and gave me amazing feedback on early drafts of the book and has been a mentor ever since. He is a historian um, of higher education and more importantly and more broadly of racial inequality in America. His book, The Campus Color Line, if you have not read it, definitely go out and get it. It takes an intimate look at how university presidents take an active role in not only shaping campus policies, but um, social policies writ large for our country that, has, that have implications for education, yes, but for housing, um, neighborhood development, and a whole host of other factors that we don't usually typically associate with the university. We will be in conversation for a little bit, but then we also have the amazing opportunity to deal with people who work on the ground with the very students and the institutions that we care about. And Maria Erb and uh, Maidani will join us um, as part of this. And Maria is the executive director of the Newberry Center um, here at BU, and Mike is director of CAS. And so we have a range of individuals who are going to be in conversation to, yes, talk about the Supreme Court decision, um, but what it means for more than just who gets in, right? Because it's shaping so much more than just admissions policy. And so the first question that I actually wanted to um, be in conversation, I forgot my password, <laughs> with Eddie about is with, with all that is new about this recent Supreme Court case, right? Um, students with fair admissions, be Harvard and, North, and, and University of North Carolina, how much of this is actually old, right? We have seen so many different iterations of attacks on affirmative action that is this that we are experiencing this new era of admissions and affirmative action. How much of this is actually old? Um, this is Eddie. First off, um, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to be in conversation with all of you. Can y'all hear me now? Even closer? I'll speak louder too. All right, sorry. Uh, this is Eddie again. Uh, uh, first, um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the invitation and looking forward to being in a conversation with you. Uh, Tony, to your question, how much of this is new? How much of this is old? Um, it's all pretty old, right? Uh, the attacks on affirmative action certainly aren't new. And the broader context around affirmative action is really important. I think if there's nothing else to take away from what I'll say as a historian of higher education, it's important to contextualize the Supreme Court decision within the original intent behind affirmative action in higher education. So quick history lecture, right? like the 32nd version. Uh, President John F. Kennedy in 63 reaches out to college presidents across the United States and he asked for their assistance in developing, quote, special programs, end quote, to address the civil rights issues within the United States because there was a history of racism in the United States, the legacy of racial discrimination in the United States, and so there needed to be some affirmative programs launched by colleges and universities to address the economic and educational disparities in the U.S which is a lot different when you fast forward to 2023 and hear talking points around the value of diversity on college campuses. Big difference. Original intent, address and redress the legacy of racism. Higher education has a responsibility to do that. Fast forward through a series of Supreme Court cases and chipping away at affirmative action programs, we end up with defending racial diversity on college campuses, which again is not the same as addressing 
two, three, four centuries of discrimination. So when you ask the question around what's new, what's old, all of this is actually pretty old, but it's been slight tweaks along the way to make us feel as if we're in a new moment, but we gotta understand the history, the broader context about how we got here. Yeah. And this is Tony. The question about now that adversity be the new metric that we use to admit students and to take into consideration for any initiatives that we have on campus is, again, not going back anywhere. Any, it's taking us even further away from the original intent because it's universalizing any kind of struggle rather than attaching itself or addressing the legislated and legalized ways in which racial groups, especially blacks, have been discriminated against. It has no connection to redlining and blockbusting. It has no connection to intentional segregation of people via whether it's in schools, workplaces, or neighborhoods. Like I always think about, when we think about affirmative action, I always want to take people away from the example and ask them, and ask them a question. If you don't believe that racial inequality exists and it was legislated, then explain to me why there's a racial gap and who knows how to swim in this country. And people are like, wait, why, what, what do you mean by, why should we care about swimming? Why is that an original example? And yet when you think about who had access to pools, public, literally just physical pools, let alone who was allowed to be in those pools, and if you were caught in them, who had bleach or other kind of dyes or other kind of things poured on you, there's a reason why we celebrate the first black woman to win the gold medal um, for swimming. There's a reason why we celebrate certain things. And when you think about the way that FHA loans were discriminated, in my office, in Tusa away, which I, which, I, which I really love my office now, um, <laughs> I have a map. In my house, I mean, and I, I got I went to the archive and got this map. This is why I love how history always reminds you of where you are and where you've been. It says Coconut Grove Negro District, and it is a map that literally has the hand-drawn segment of where Black people in Coconut Grove could live and could not live, and that's just one part of it. What schools you went to, how, what clean air did you did or did not have access to, what park you could enter. And yet, when you think about how that has a cumulative effect over our lives, moving away from any kind of understanding of that kind of racial inequality that was written into American law, we find ourselves, adversity does not, uh, adversity is not colorblind, and it's not race neutral. Spot on. I mean, uh, you, you captured it per perfectly, because if we say we're no longer gonna consider race the same way, but now let's consider sort of personal adversity. That immediately wipes away centuries of responsibility on how legislation has worked at the local, state, and federal level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is universal. I love the example about racial disparities and who can and can't swim, right? And I think about that example, you gave the Coconut Grove example, right? Shout out to South Florida, right? Mm -hmm. But I grew up in West Alabama, Greene County specifically. There were two swimming pools in, our, in the biggest town in my county, right? One on the black side of town, one on the white side of town. When forced to desegregate, you know what my town did? They closed both pools. So fast forward a couple of generations about who has a public pool to go to, especially in the rural black south, right? You don't have that example. Now, fast forward to time to apply for college, and now everybody is telling an adversity story. It's not quite the same when you consider everybody's adversity sort of on the same plane mm -hmm. when it's not really that way. Yeah. And it's not really designed that way. And history tells us that adversity, generations and centuries built up and it hits different students differently, and that's what comes into our classrooms, our office spaces, but we try to treat it the same. This is Tony, and the, the fact that both the Supreme Court and President, President um, Biden is in favor of this kind of step about talking about your adversity and your applications 
to me, that puts the onus of responsibility on the applicant to pimp out their poverty yet again, right? It becomes this litmus test about how much of a case can you make to be memorable in admissions. In other words, as I said in the Times and got in trouble with NACAT, to make white women admissions counselors cry. So they can have someone on that committee to be like, no, this person deserves it because of how troubling their story is. Now, Eddie, you write beautifully and specifically about the role that college leaders, especially presidents, play in not only, again, not only academic affairs on campus, but of political affairs in the nation. So much of the conversation that we're having now on affirmative action ignores individual action of those individuals in almost all of this. What do you make of the doctrine of principal neutrality, the stance that college presidents and provosts should not weigh into current events for fear of losing sight of the larger mission of their institution and in higher education? This is Eddie, that's a great question. Uh, first, I don't believe in the principle of neutrality in academic leadership because history tells us that has never been exercised. In so many ways, there have been academic leaders ha who have been anything but neutral in their decision making. Residential housing, perfect example. You can go from city to city across the United States and as university campuses got larger, a lot of communities got smaller. And oftentimes those were black communities or other communities of color. That's anything but a neutral decision. So now all of a sudden when there are efforts to actually make some racial progress in American higher education, now all of a sudden we want to ad adapt this sort of principle of neutrality. Why now, right? And so we have to think about how can we make, again, affirmative decisions, conscious decisions, active work as leaders, because leaders have this social responsibility. Like if you can say universities have a responsibility to make society better, how can you as an academic leader, provost, chancellor, president, dean, how can you also say, I'm gonna take a neutral stance on making social change? History doesn't allow that. History tells us otherwise. So why would we do that today? Now, our, arguably more than ever, we need bold, courageous leaders to actually take a stance. Because oftentimes to not do anything is to do the most, the most harm. I remember, this is Tony, I remember reading your book and the number of white college presidents for decades who lobbied for the underfunding or the restriction of funding to HBCUs. Uh, I remember the example that you used, I believe it was in, in Maryland, there was a college president um, and a host of other people. And then now that HBCUs are seen as the next black savior um, of higher education is ignoring the history of underfunding and the political crippling of the very institutions that now you are saying has to be the fixer of all the ills of racial inequalities in higher education. This is Eddie. Um, the point about HBCUs now, post June 29th, post Supreme Court decision, being sort of the oasis, if you will, for racial opportunity in higher education, uh, we can't think of these issues around HBCU underfunding separate from the Supreme Court decision. What we see in American higher education right now is a multi-point attack on black access and black opportunity to higher education. There's a reason HBCUs for decades have been underfunded and now we have a Supreme Court ruling that says race can't be considered the same way in admissions to predominantly white institutions alongside active state legislators making decisions around what aspects of black history can and can't be taught, alongside other states saying diversity, equity, and inclusion offices need to be closed, on top of this fifth point that states are trying to weaken the faculty tenure system. All of these things are working together actively 
toward the same goal, which is to return American higher education to the same sort of white elite control and shut all the doors, all the points of access. And so you're right. You can't say, okay, HBCUs are going to have double, triple, quadruple the applicants now. Well, if you underfunded these institutions in every way possible for the past 100 years, how can they even accommodate that? So if you can't all of a sudden go to an HBCU and you can't go to the predominantly white institutions, where can you go to college? And don't even get me started on how we've underfunded community colleges, our two-year institutions. American higher education is under attack because if you can control American higher education, you control society and the future. Just that simple. And that's what we're witnessing right now. It's, you, you speak on, this is Tony, exactly where I wanted to go um, and also after this be able to bring Maria and Mike into this because just today, for example, Yale reached a settlement in light of the decisions for students for fair admissions. Um, and, um, and one of the things is that Yale will ensure that, quote, that race is not a factor in any financial or calculation of awards. But it doesn't start, stop there because the SCOTUS decision are not just about admissions to college, but also about what happens about the day to day. We have seen the moves by, for example, the University of Missouri, which has a very complicated history when it comes to racial segregation, to end scholarships that factor in race and ethnicity. So diversity scholarships to individuals, whether they were black, Latino, native, um, or indigenous. And the University of Arkansas dissolved their diversity, equity, and inclusion office alongside other programming and initiatives for fear of being seen as violating the law. Even though the Supreme Court case did not stipulate many of these moves as being in compliance with what Justice Roberts wrote in the decision. What do we make of these moves? This is Eddie. Well, <laughs> first is the overcorrection, the unnecessary overcorrection, right? It's almost as if uh, the Supreme Court decision gave permission to do some things that people have been wanting to do all along. Um, and that's the sad reality of a lot of people who lead our colleges and universities across the United States. Because, uh, like you said, the Supreme Court decision did not weigh in on sort of your DEI office, right, or your diversity scholarships. But this sort of additional step to take those away speaks to my previous point around the overall attack on higher education. That's the first thing. But this also reminds me of our opportunity, which probably is a great transition to, to, to bring up our colleagues around more conversations about what history tells us we can do. And so one thing that would happen in response to President Kennedy in the summer of 63 reaching out to college presidents only one aspect of what we now consider affirmative action was about race conscious decisions at predominantly white institutions. There were actually four or five different initiatives that created the broad affirmative action in American higher education. And a lot of those programs were geared towards system wide change within US higher education. There was the brief moment where there was deep investment and in interest in historically black colleges. There were faculty exchange programs between predominantly white institutions and historically black colleges. There was emphasis on graduate level education, which is probably relevant to all of you thinking about graduate students and what does that mean for societal change and those, those alums going forward. And so history gives us a lot of examples of things that we still can do because that did not go before the court. And we actually have a great opportunity right now in a lot of ways to revisit the past and look at what we briefly considered as an opportunity during the mid 1960s that we've gotten away from. Again, we've gotten away from that original goal, the original intent, which was addressing the legacy of racism and sort of along the way after the Bakke case, the talking point became the value of diversity on college campuses or similar to your point around the value of everybody having some level of adversity, right? And so we've got to start thinking about what does history tell us? Serious, critical thinking about history 
tell us that we still can do today because the past actually gives us a bit of a blueprint around how we can still make progress in this moment. And this is Tony. And with that explicit um, connection to policy and practice, I want to bring up two people who are experts in carrying out the things that make these places and our institutions not only accessible, um, but equitable in their carrying out of different things. And so I would like to invite uh, Maria and Mike uh, to join us. I would like to, this is Tony, I would like to, for us to spend time talking about the gaps between proclamation and practice, between saying we're inclusive and actually being so. And so I don't know if, if Michael or Maria, you wanted to start and weigh in on the context that we find ourselves in and how, it, how you view how it's shaping your, your work and approaches. So I can begin. Hi, this is Maria Erb. I'm the executive director of the Newberry Center, and I use she, her pronouns, and really pleased to be here today with you. Um, I think especially for our first-gen center, so I'm the director of the Newberry Center, and we have the definitions up here. Um, we define our first-gen undergraduates as students whose parents, guardians, or caregivers have not completed a bachelor's degree, and that's pretty standard across the country. There's no common definition we know, but it's pretty standard, and that's what admissions uses. And then we also uniquely support first-gen grad and professional students at Boston University, um, and the, that definition is slightly different because um, we recognize students whose parents or guardians or caregivers have not completed an advanced degree. And the reason for that is because we've experienced students whose parents were first-generation college students and their parents never were able to go on for an advanced degree. So that's why we support them. Um, so it's always helpful to get the context of, of first gen. And I think what's really interesting is in, in the first gen world that I'm working in right now is that we, um, you know, people are, are jumping to this conclusion and we have to be sure not to use first gen as a proxy for race with this whole movement because not all first-gen students are students of color and vice versa, just as we also need to talk about how not all first-gen students are low income and vice versa. So we always have to be sure that we um, are, are um, conscious of that. However, we do know that there are intersections of identity and so that will, that will happen for our students. But you know, because of this, this, this new, um, world that we're kind of living in with this decision, um, first-gen centers and initiatives across the country are going to start getting more and more attention because of, uh, you know, trying to find ways around it. So um, that, that's kind of where we sit right now. Um, I, let me just quickly tell you about a couple of things about the Newberry Center, and then I think Mike has some slides as well. Um, just a couple of things for all of you as faculty and staff in Wheelock. Um, I put up QR codes and I think David's going to share the slides with everybody. Um, but we have a Terrier First Advocates training and for those of you who are like, well, what can we do here at BU? You can actually become trained as Terrier First Advocates so our first gen students will know that you're a resource or that you know a little bit about them. So um, we're the goal is to try to get all faculty and staff at BU trained. Um, we have a long way to go, but it makes your students feel a lot better when they come around your offices and they see that Terrier First Advocate sign in your office. The other thing is if you are a first-gen college graduate, this is the exception. As a faculty and staff member, you can be inducted into trial of the National Honor Society. So another way that you can support and be part of the Newberry Center and then the next slide, which you will receive, um, all of our contact information and where we're located at um, 755 Commonwealth Ave in the basement of the School of Theology. Great, thanks Maria. Uh, thanks Eddie and thanks Tony. Um, I'm Mike Dennehy, he, him, Executive Director of College Access and Student Success. And our office uh, runs the whole continuum of programming, kindergarten through PhD. And so there's a great group of professionals, if you all could wave to everybody here sitting in the audience. 
uh, that support this work, both in the pre-college space and in the undergraduate space. Um, and so I wanted to, a lot of people know us from our pre-college programs, some people know us from our undergraduate programs, some people know us from our graduate programs, but we run the whole gambit. And I'd like to thank Eddie and Tony for taking us back to uh, JFK. I'd like to touch on his successor, LBJ, uh, and Upper Bound was part of that effort in the 1960s to promote an equal higher education system. And so uh, part of that legacy lives at BU and many other institutions across the country right now. Next slide, please. Uh, given the topic of the SCOTUS decisions, uh, I wanted to kind of focus on our undergraduate program. So uh, on this slide, you'll see a group of partnerships that Boston University Admissions enters into with a number of either school districts or nonprofits throughout the country. Uh, our oldest partnership is 1973 with the Boston Public Schools and what is now called the Menino Scholarship. Again, taking us back to the history that Eddie and Tony were talking about, that 1973 scholarship in the city of Boston had, every, had a big part to do with the desegregation efforts that were happening and the call from uh, the city to say, how can institution higher ed institutions or higher education help Boston public school graduates? So um, when we talk about the history of it and history repeating itself um, or learn lessons learned from history, um, those are two direct connections to our office and its work. Um, if we could go with the... Uh, and, and what I will also say is that until 2008, the only partner that was on that board was BPS. All those other partnerships were since 2008. Uh, and so BU did a lot of learning in 2008 when a lot of those partnerships opened up. And we're going to talk about students finding belonging in a minute as part of the panel. This is Tony. You both mentioned um, this uh, game of proxies that we are now finding ourselves in? What can be the thing that we use to approximate, to get in, to get close to where we want to work? Is it first gen status? Is it using it by place? Um, how do you all see conversations, not just with admissions about who we let in, but with Dean of Students offices about how do we support those students that we are now so actively recruiting who we're going to double down on these proxies. And what I mean by proxies is it's not just first generation college student status that is being used. More universities are adopting um, place-based policies. So for example, Duke um, essentially copied the Carolina Covenant at the University of North Carolina and the public schools do, where they're saying if you come from the area, and especially from specific places in the state, um, we will give you a full scholarship. When you think about schools like Berea, um, that is, um, uh, I think 90% first gen, but mostly uh, it, it targets poor people from rural Appalachia and certain backgrounds. Um, other universities are now using it as a model in which they haven't been practicing it. It's new to them because they were going on with the status quo. So, you know, when I see Posse and Questbridge and Chicago scholars and Evanston scholars, and then when I see people use first gen, the question I have is, what hopes or what fears do you have in this game of proxies that we find ourselves in? I think, especially at this point in time, with the very beginning of school, where we see, um, you know, we, we've recruited the students and now they're here. And so how do we support them and I am tired <laughs> right now from the support, you know, everything from, um, you know, one of my students this morning who works in the office, BU Today put out um, a, a video about the wonderful move-in last week, right, of parents dropping their children off and giving them hugs and kisses. This student is now a senior, has not had his parent come bring him any of the years and was just really triggered by, by that, you know, that's the message that the general public gets right here at BU, but what about those students who have to fly in? I had to work with the Dean of Students Office because a student's like, uh-oh, the schedule for orientation doesn't actually start until tomorrow, but I'll stay overnight in Logan Airport. He's coming by himself from Texas. You can't do that. So we work together to find a hostel in downtown Boston 
to have a place for him to stay and then figure out how to get to campus with a suitcase. You imagine all the students coming in, you know? So it's like, this, this is where I'm, I'm grateful that the Newberry Center is in place, but this is only from the, the students who emerge. So how can institutions put in these mechanisms or structures to ensure that, you know, we, it's like, it's great, look at us, we're bringing all of these students in, but then we need to be prepared to support them. I just had an email from a stu two students saying, it is so hot in our rooms and we have no fan and we haven't been able to sleep in our rooms. I get it, it's hot, but then how do we put those things in place to get some of our students' basic needs? So, so it's like, you know, all this publicity is, is up here for the students and how great it is at the beginning of the year, but let's keep in mind and remember we have a, you know, 20% of, of our class is first gen. Not all of them have these same needs, but we have to remember that there are students who have these needs. Thanks. Um, if I could get next slide too. Uh, oh, thanks, David. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, our undergrads. Uh, so this is the race and ethnic iPads race and ethnicity data for the students that we serve through college access and student success. So to answer your question, though, Tony, is unless students are in the place-based partnerships that we work with, and I can tell you we have no place-based partnerships in Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, so. They can help as a proxy, but they ex still exclude a lot of students, right? Because geographically, you, there's 50 states, U.S. territories, you can't cover it all in those partnerships. Um, BU, I will flat out say, was not ready um, to welcome those students in 2008 when we first entered into partnerships with Posse, um, and then later with the BPS Community Scholars, which is Menino's a merit scholarship, BPS Community is a full need scholarship. So there's been a lot of lessons learned over that, that I guess it's 15 years now almost. Um, but there's still a lot of lessons to learn and Maria kind of highlighted some of those. Um, I, think, um, I think it can still be a challenge, but I, I do think what one of the things you highlighted, Maria, was is I think BU has taken an ecosystems approach to supporting students because Maria or I or Claire or Nafisa, we can hop on the phone with the Dean of Students Office who's got a specific set of resources. Or I can call Maria and she's got a specific set of resources. So that we do try to um, be holistic in support for students and that the Newbury Center has been added to the BU list of supports is really important. People will say, why is there a Newbury Center in college access and student success? Only about 55% of our undergrads are first gen that we work with, right? So, um, I think there's also an assumption that everyone who comes to our comes through our programs as first gen. Uh, it just as you know, I think there's a lot of assumptions. So, yeah, this is Tony. It also assumes a lot about who students feel comfortable with, right? right? To understand that a one size fit all model works is just wrong, uh, or to assume that a one size fits all model works. When I think about the work of Becca Bassett, that shows. You know, there are some offices that feel more intimate and smaller to students. I mean, sorry, are smaller and more intimate and feel more comfortable for certain students for certain backgrounds, and others that are more that one-stop shop can affect students. The number of students who are international, the number of students who are from rural versus city, from different backgrounds, we have to be able to meet them where they are. Now, housing becomes a very important role, and Eddie, I would love for you to comment on this because Boston, as we all know, is a very expensive city, and LA isn't too far behind as a professor at um, UCLA. The history of our institution, as you mentioned, like the, more, the bigger the university gets, the more segregation happens, the more gentrification happens, and the rising cost, and how do we begin to help students afford what it means to be here, to be members of the community? How are our institutions, what, is the, what are our institutions' responsibility to creating a fuller sense of community for students who we admit in, given the rising cost, not just of higher education, but of being a student, especially in expensive cities that have a specific and unique racial histories that don't allow them to always see a piece of themselves or a slice of home just like other people can? This is Eddie. <laughs> I think a lot about that, uh, like you said, LA is maybe more expensive 
than Boston um, in some parts. Well, our institutions have a tremendous responsibility because our institutions are largely responsible for <laughs> the increase in how much it costs to live on campus or near campus, right? So first of all, uh, universities are some of the largest real estate owners in most major cities. If you look at the number of acres and who's responsible for it, it's probably a university, first of all. And so a significant portion of cost of living comes down to the university, and the universities actually have a responsibility in terms of uh, rectifying that, right? Whether that is um, actually using portions of its property, because all of it doesn't look like a university. Universities own much more than what looks like campus. So thinking about what that means in terms of um, mixed use or uh, different values of, of property for students, that's the first thing. The second part that universities have to do after acknowledging their responsibility in the high cost of living is actually work with its adjacent community. Too often, colleges and universities set out their own strategic plan, they've got their own initiatives, and then they want to have a partnership with the community, and sort of afterthought is engaging the community. But oftentimes, the neighborhoods near campus or a mile from campus have their own goals, their own community priorities. And universities actually have to start thinking about housing and the community as an equal partner in the educational enterprise, not just a partner, like a silent or minority partner, but like as an equal partner. And so too often, we sort of let institutional leaders, presidents, chancellors, provosts, deans, sort of react after the fact in their communi communications and conversations with the community, but there has to be a meaningful connection. Uh, I give a historic example just to wrap up my comment. When the University of Chicago, Southside Chicago, was pushing out black communities, especially in Woodlawn area to the south and Washington Park to the west, black residents in that community, they said, it's not that we don't want community development, we want that too. But can you rightfully go about gentrification, community development, or at the time, urban renewal, without also addressing the issue of housing? And we're having that same conversation 60 years later. Can we have conversations about university growth and development without also talking about housing? Because if a student is insecure at the very basics in that respect, what can we expect of them in terms of classroom performance and actually engaging the rest of campus? History tells us that we're still dealing with the same problem. This is Tony. Anna Maria, you've helped many students find housing, not just for move-in, but when things go rough during a semester, which is often tied to what's happening at home. And Mike, given that your community partnerships are rooted in Boston, and Boston being a city of neighborhoods, we also see different calls that students get at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, we know Boston, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be part of Street Safe doing their evaluation and other things. We know how housing plays such a huge role, but also students' connections to the very communities that are being worsened by some of our university's policies. When you think about the debates in Austin, right? When you think about how Watertown is now preparing for a similar type of infiltration by universities. How do we begin to prepare for those problems coming to campus. Yeah, this is Maria. Uh, you know, it's it's really difficult. I, it, we, I think communities and the universities just have to work more closely together to plan. Um, you know, I I work, of course, specifically with the first gen uh, indicator or identity, but. Many of our students, for example, international students. You know, I've worked with some international students. They come to the US, they have no credit here in the United States. So how is it that they can find housing? We know that the graduate student housing that's available here, I think they only have like 1,000 beds and we have, you know, uh, over 17,000 graduate and professional students. So how is it that the university, as Eddie talked about, can 
can be more proactive. And, and the challenge, too, for us is we're competing with MIT and Northeastern and Harvard, all of these places. Um, so, so, you know, there's a lot of scrambling on folks like us on the ground where, where we're literally trying to find beds for students. I had a student whose housing fell through. He was in the School of Law. Housing fell through as he was starting school. And so now where is he supposed to go? So trying to reach out to as many partners and, and folks who might have housing, but it's, you know, and you think about the, the well-being of the students as they're still trying to be students and start the semester. So um, I don't know if I have an answer. It's just such a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, we've had students who are L Boston residents, BPS, that haven't pl had a place to go home during intercession, right? And so working with the Dean of Students Office, you know, Claire reached out to Steve Singer. There is uh, housing that's available to students with need over intercession. BU actually puts them up in a hotel for intercession. Um, BU's dining halls used to not to be open during um, like Thanksgiving break or spring break. Those dining hall, there is a dining hall always open during those periods of time now. That only happened three years ago, maybe four years ago, right? So, um, so I think those are two examples to answer your question, Tony. Um, and then I think the bigger picture was is that um, universities uh, can be held accountable by political leadership. And so Mayor Menino was really good at that. Uh, and so, um, I think that's a, there's an external factor that universities are obligated to respond to, uh, and that tends to be um, the mayor of the city that they're they're housed, because they're tax exempt. You, uh, so, in a lot of cities, depend on their uh, property tax revenue to pay for things. This is Tony. I want to open that, and so I wanted to um, first say thank you to. Eddie, Mike, and Maria um, for joining us, and I wanted to end with this. In The Price of the Ticket, the ever prescient essay, as James Baldwin notes, it goes without saying, I believe, that if we understood ourselves better, we would, do damage, we, we would damage ourselves less, and I agree. To admit a diverse class of undergraduates, graduate students, and even to support a diverse group of people who we hire and try to keep, it mandates that colleges support that diversity. But without understanding the inequities that shape every facet of life, especially college life, we will never be able to live up to that directive, not in good times and definitely not in bad. Diversity devoid of an understanding is worse than a broken promise. It is one that was never intended to be kept. Students, all of our students, need us to be better and do better, to work harder to keep that promise. Students' testimonies, and we should listen to them, serve as an invitation to learn from missed opportunities to do less damage. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. I, um, I did learn that Eddie's in Boston for the full year, so it's... Hopefully he'll come back and join us again and, and uh, perhaps do a salon or something about his work in particular, um, his historical work. So thank you so much, Eddie. Yeah, yeah. We have one last segment of the day, um, and then we'll, uh, bye. thank you, Maria, thanks. Um, uh, and that is Mary Churchill and Cara Metag Metagliano, is that correct? Yeah, who are going to talk about our, um, our Strategic and community, strategic partnerships and community engagement, and then we'll break for our reception. Excellent. So Karen and I are going to do this together, and she's about a foot taller than I am, so I don't know. I'm going to go back and forth with the mic. Um, so originally, David wanted uh, us to uh, talk about metrics, and I and that and that was supposed to be in the morning. And then we found out we were after this amazing panel and before beer and wine. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be really fun. Like, that's what we're going to hit you with. So we tried to uh, make it a little more uh, interesting. We were also going to have it interactive, but our time was cut short. So um, we'll try uh, to move through this. And if you have questions along the way, raise your hand, because um, I would entertain those. Okay. 
So first, um, the Strategic Partnerships and Community Engagement Office, what do we do? And this language, most of this comes straight from our strategic plan. So the entire presentation we're about to give is related to the strategic plan that the faculty and staff adopted in January 2021, and that clearly we were so thrilled when the provost spoke to it. Um, this group, many of you did some really heavy lifting during that time. And so um, 